Being and Death Our ontological analysis of our default being in the world has been static, without considering its relation to time. Continuing our analysis of the underlying ontological structure of being, we will connect the concepts of care and temporality. As before, we will forge that connection through a methodical process of phenomenological self-reflection. Our analysis of being in the world so far has been restricted to the negative. First, we focused upon inauthentic modes of being by concentrating on our average everydayness. Second, we downplayed the general structure of life as a unified whole by concentrating on the ontological structure of specific moods, such as anxiety. We now reconsider these topics to demonstrate the fundamental relation of being in time. The triple ontological structure of this section and those immediately following is authenticity, totality, and temporality. It would be natural to see this discussion as deepening the understanding presented in our previous claims by drawing out their implications. We begin this series from a provisional concept of the human as a being who questions his own being unfolding the articulated unity of the worldly existential structure implicit in that conception led us to a deep understanding of being in the world as care. Here we begin again from the conception of being as care and unfold the articulated unity of temporality implicit in it. This will reveal that the structure of care reveals an internal relation between our being and time. The sequence of our presentation does not mean that time is a secondary or consequent factor in being. Imposing a sequential structure on ontological inquiry would imply that each new stage of ontological discovery presupposes its predecessors. But such a linear presentation is merely an artifact of the nature of our language. It cannot capture the full richness, complexity, and simultaneity of the internal ontological structure of being. Our study of death, guilt, and conscience does not simply deepen our understanding of the arguments advanced so far. Summarizing the characterization of our being as care provides an uncanny context or horizon against which to articulate the topic of death. However, this topic will also destabilize, even subvert, our previous understanding. This creates a deep but creative and revelatory tension among the concepts of care and death, guilt and conscience. Death and Mortality Any philosophical attempt to grasp our being as a whole faces the ontological difficulty that we are oriented towards the future, and so are incomplete. However, once our life is over and the whole is available for examination, we are no longer here to examine it. We always already project upon possibilities, so we are oriented towards the not yet actual. That structural incompletion is overcome only when we are no longer here. Thus, grasping our existence in totality seems to be contradictory. For us to be whole is for us to be no longer, and so incapable of relating to our life as a whole. Death is our ultimate problem. It brings our existence to an end, completing it, but we cannot experience our own death. We may experience dying, but our death is not an event in our life, not even the last one. It seems impossible for us to grasp our own existence as a whole. This is a huge obstacle for anyone trying to make sense of our existence. It is also a profound challenge to the understanding we have achieved so far, and to the scope of what we can achieve with the phenomenological method. The earlier characterization of our being as care was intended to give us a handle on our being as a whole. But one aspect of the ontological structure of care is being ahead of ourselves. Our orientation toward the not-yet-actual hides the problem of death, 
concealing an essential incompleteness in our analysis. Our phenomenological method relies upon our capacity to disclose phenomena as they are in themselves by direct personal encounter. But no one ever encounters their own death. Then how could there be a genuinely phenomenological understanding of death and so a genuinely complete existential analysis of our being? Our aim is to gain a proper understanding of the wholeness of human beingness. We can relate to the death of another, but we cannot grasp another's life as a totality. We can only experience the transition of another human from being to no longer being. To us, their corpse is more than just a body. It is a body from which life has departed. And we can continue to relate to the dead person through funerals, commemorative rites, and the religious cults of burial or reincarnation. Thus, we continue to experience the modes of being with them as no longer with us. But these aspects of this person's dying and death apply to us still living. They are modes of our continued existence, not theirs. To grasp the life of the dead person as a whole, we must grasp the ontological meaning of his dying and death to him, for the totality or wholeness of his life is the issue. The loss and suffering a person's dying signifies for others brings us no closer to the loss of beingness that he suffers, and so no closer to understanding what it is for an individual's existence to attain wholeness or completion. This false trail nevertheless yields a crucial implication. No one can substitute for another with respect to dying and death. Death is in every case unavoidably individual. To pursue this, we must uncover the existential significance of death and its role in our lives. Death is the end of a person's life, that in which our distinctive lack of totality finds its completion. But what kind of completion is that? Death is not a limit in the way that a frame is the limit of a picture. The frame ends the picture, but does not annihilate it in the way that death annihilates a person. This reveals the futility of modeling any aspect of our being on another object. For example, we may think of a human life as an accumulation of moments, events, and experiences into a whole. Death, then, appears as the final piece that completes the puzzle. But when death comes to us, we are no longer here. Life is not like an incomplete archway to which death becomes the capstone. Similarly, using the example of the life of a fruit, death would signify the natural culmination of our existence in the same way that the ripened state of a fruit completes its life cycle. But death is not our fulfillment or ripening. We often die unfulfilled, with many of our distinctive possibilities unexplored, our life purpose unattained. We have to lead our lives. We must make decisions about which existential possibilities we will actualize and which we will not. Death's true significance as the end of our life, as its completion, thus depends upon the significance of our existence as throne projection, as a being whose being is care as we defined it earlier. Hence, we must understand death experientially as a possibility of our being. But since no one can directly experience his own death, we must shift our analytical focus from death understood as an actuality to death understood as a possibility. Only then can we talk of death as something that a living person can experience. That is, we must recreate our relation to our death. It is not something we realize when we die, but something we realize, or fail to, in our life. Ontology of Death What, then, is the distinctive character of death? Death is the possibility of the absolute impossibility of our existence. Thus, death reveals itself as that possibility which is above all one's own most, non-relational and inevitable. Death, then, is a kind of absolute, 
by which we can measure the authenticity of everything else in our life. Our death is something distinctively impending. It stands always before us as something that is not yet come. But unlike any other possibility of our being, it can only impend. It can never arrive. Other possibilities can impend, but they can also arrive, be actualized. But we cannot relate to our death as anything other than an impending possibility. For when that possibility is actualized, we are no longer who we are now. Death makes our existence absolutely impossible. Hence, we can relate to death only as a possibility. Further, it stands before us as a possibility throughout our existence. There is no moment in which our death is impossible. Every moment of our existence might be our last. Hence, unlike any other possibility of our being, death for us is always and only a possibility. This purely impending threat manifests the articulated unity of our existence as thrown projection, our being always already ahead of ourselves. Since death is our impending utter non-existence, and since we must accept that possibility in every moment of our existence, death stands before us as the potentiality for being that is most our own. It is the unique possibility in which what is at issue is nothing less than our being in the world. We are certain to die. Death is an unavoidable possibility. And in death, all our relations to any other person are undone. In other words, death is a non-relational possibility. Death is hardly unique in that respect. No one else can die my death, but also no one else can have my nose. However, my very being in the world is not at issue when I blow my nose. The point is that the non-relational nature of death highlights an aspect of our relation to all our existential possibilities. For, in making concrete our being ahead of ourselves, the fact that no one can die our death for us also emphasizes the fact that our life is ours alone to live. Another remarkable feature of death as an existential possibility is that it is not really an existential possibility at all. A genuine existential possibility might be made actual, but our own death cannot be realized in our existence. If our death becomes actual, we are no longer here to experience it. This means death is not just the possibility of our non-existence, of the absolute impossibility of our being. It is also an existential impossibility. If death as an existential possibility is a contradiction in terms, how can we gain phenomenological access to death by existential observation and analysis? We cannot understand our relation to our own death on the model of our relation to any genuine possibility of our being. We cannot fully grasp death except in the context of the difference between ontic and ontological matters, between what can be and what is. But we can present it as an ontological structure rather than an existential state that structure makes possible. Then why consider death as an existential possibility at all? Doesn't this terminology encourage misunderstanding? No, because it underlies a key insight. Although we can't coherently regard death as an existential possibility, neither can we understand our relation to it apart from our relation to our existential possibilities, to our being ahead of ourselves. Our relation to death is manifest in the relation we establish and maintain, or fail to maintain, to every genuine possibility of our being, and hence to our being itself. Thank you.